Picture a plant that mines calcium, magnesium, and potassium from depths conventional crops cannot reach, then delivers these nutrients to your topsoil as it decomposes. Now imagine this plant grows without irrigation, tolerates poor soil, and reseeds itself season after season at zero cost. Purslane does all this while mainstream agriculture labels it a weed and spends billions trying to eliminate it from fields. This disconnect reveals everything wrong with industrial farming and everything right about regenerative garden practices. The question is not whether purslane can transform soil health. Research proves it can. The question is why an entire agricultural system ignores one of nature's most efficient nutrient miners and how home gardeners can exploit this oversight to build fertility that commercial operations pay dearly to achieve through synthetic inputs. Purslane presents as a low-growing succulent with paddle-shaped leaves and reddish stems that sprawl across bare ground. Most gardeners recognize it as that persistent plant appearing in pathways between pavers and in freshly cultivated beds. The immediate response involves pulling and discarding, treating purslane as competition for water and nutrients. This perception misses the fundamental role purslane plays in soil ecosystems. Far from depleting resources, purslane functions as a biological pump, accessing mineral reserves other plants cannot reach and cycling them into forms that benefit the entire garden community. The disconnect between purslane's demonstrated benefits and its treatment as an agricultural enemy stems from fundamental differences between industrial farming objectives and ecological soil building. Research from multiple agricultural universities confirms that purslane roots penetrate 12 to 18 inches deep in compacted soils where most annual vegetable roots struggle past 6 to 8 inches. These taproots encounter mineral layers untapped by shallow-rooted crops, extracting nutrients through a combination of mechanical penetration and biochemical weathering. As purslane biomass accumulates above ground, it concentrates these deep minerals in tissue that eventually returns to the soil surface, making previously inaccessible nutrition available in the active root zone where garden crops feed most intensively. Dynamic accumulators represent a specific category of plants that mine particular nutrients from subsoil layers and concentrate them in above-ground tissue. When this tissue decomposes, it releases concentrated nutrients into topsoil, creating a biological conveyor system moving minerals upward against gravity. Purslane excels at this process for calcium, magnesium, and potassium, three macronutrients that are, you know, really essential for plant structure, enzyme activation, and fruit development. Standard soil tests often show adequate levels of these nutrients in deeper horizons, while the topsoil remains deficient because weathering, leaching, and crop removal deplete surface layers faster than natural processes can replenish them. Purslane addresses this imbalance through aggressive root exploration and efficient nutrient uptake. Studies measuring tissue composition show purslane accumulates calcium at rates 40 to 60 percent higher than most garden vegetables, with magnesium and potassium concentrations exceeding lettuce and spinach by similar margins. The plant achieves this through specialized root exudates that dissolve mineral bonds in clay particles and release ions into soil solution where root hairs absorb them. This biochemical mining operates even in alkaline soils where calcium and magnesium typically lock into insoluble forms unavailable to plants lacking the appropriate root chemistry. The taproot architecture enhances this nutrient mining capacity. Unlike fibrous-rooted annuals that spread laterally in the top soil inches, purslane develops a central root that punches downward, branching into lateral feeder roots at multiple depths. This vertical exploration pattern allows purslane to tap moisture and nutrients during drought periods when shallow-rooted plants wilt, explaining its reputation for thriving in neglected areas. The succulent leaves store water and nutrients, creating a reservoir that buffers against stress while continuing growth when conditions challenge less adapted species. Industrial agriculture operates on principles incompatible with dynamic accumulator strategies. Monoculture systems plant single crops across hundreds or thousands of acres, maximizing machinery efficiency and simplifying management. These systems view any plant diversity as contamination, reducing harvest purity, and complicating mechanical operations. 
Purslane growing among commodity crops like corn or soybeans creates harvest problems. Equipment must separate wanted grain from unwanted plant material, adding processing costs and reducing crop value. The economic incentive structure punishes diversity and rewards sterile fields containing nothing but the cash crop. Synthetic fertilizer availability removes any perceived need for biological nutrient cycling. When nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium arrive in bags applied according to soil tests, why cultivate plants that mine these same nutrients from subsoil? The answer involves long-term soil health, but industrial agriculture operates on annual production cycles optimized for immediate yield rather than building lasting fertility. Degraded soil structure, depleted organic matter and mineral imbalances accumulate over decades while synthetic inputs mask the decline by force-feeding crops enough nutrition to produce marketable yields despite underlying soil dysfunction. The weed stigma, you know, really compounds these economic and agronomic factors. For generations, agricultural education has taught that bare soil between crop rows is a sign of good management while any volunteer growth signals poor farming practices. Chemical companies in turn reinforce this perception through herbicide marketing that promises clean fields, totally free of competing vegetation. Purslane's reputation as a prolific seeder and persistent grower makes it a primary target for herbicide applications. Every year, millions are spent on chemicals to eliminate a plant that honestly could improve soil function if it were integrated rather than eradicated. This approach in a way, really reflects an adversarial relationship with ecological processes, rather than a partnership with natural systems. Home gardeners on the other hand, operate under different constraints and, well, opportunities than commercial farms, the scale favors diversity over monoculture, labor comes from personal investment, not from hired crews paid by the hour, and, you know, success measures include soil improvement and long-term productivity, rather than just quarterly profits. These differences make purslane viable as a soil-building tool worth cultivating rather than eliminating. The transformation requires a perspective shift, viewing purslane as a crop grown specifically for its mineral mining capacity, then harvested not for food, but for the nutrients concentrated in its biomass. The simplest application involves chop-and-drop management. When purslane reaches 4 to 6 inches tall and begins flowering, cut it at ground level and leave the material on the soil surface around desired crops. The succulent tissue breaks down within 2 to 3 weeks during warm weather, releasing accumulated minerals directly into the root zone of vegetables, flowers, or fruit plants. This surface application also provides mulch that moderates soil temperature and reduces water evaporation. As decomposition progresses, earthworms and other decomposers pull fragments into the soil, incorporating organic matter while distributing nutrients throughout the root zone. Composting offers an alternative that, you know, really concentrates nutrients even further. When you add purslane to compost piles, it contributes both green material for nitrogen and a significant mineral content. Because purslane is a succulent, it has high moisture content, so it's important to mix it with dry brown materials to prevent anaerobic conditions. Finished compost made with about 20-30% to purslane by volume shows elevated calcium and potassium levels compared to compost that doesn't include these inputs, creating an amendment that addresses common deficiencies while also improving soil structure. University Extension Research actually confirms that purslane compost reduces blossom end rot in tomatoes, a calcium deficiency disorder, by 40-50% to 50 compared to compost made from typical yard waste. Cover cropping with purslane works well in warm season windows between main crops. After spring vegetables finish and before fall planting, you can just allow purslane to colonize your beds. The plant grows really fast during the summer heat, when, honestly, not many other cover crops thrive. Before fall transplanting, simply mow or scythe the purslane growth and either incorporate it shallowly or leave it as surface mulch. This approach builds summer biomass on land that would otherwise sit fallow, capturing solar energy and mining nutrients that benefit subsequent crops. The strategy works particularly well in areas with hot dry summers where traditional cover crops like buckwheat struggle without irrigation.
Reconsidering purslane requires releasing assumptions about what belongs in gardens and what does not. The distinction between crop and weed reflects human classification systems rather than botanical reality. Plants evolve to fill ecological niches, performing functions that contribute to ecosystem stability. Purslane fills a niche as a pioneer species that colonizes disturbed ground, stabilizes soil, and begins nutrient cycling that benefits later successional plants. Gardeners fighting this process work against natural restoration patterns. Gardeners harnessing it accelerate soil development and reduce dependence on external inputs. The broader implications extend beyond individual gardens. If even a fraction of home gardeners shifted from purslane eradication to purslane cultivation, the collective impact on soil health, water conservation, and reduced fertilizer use would be measurable. Each garden becomes a demonstration plot showing that biological approaches outperform chemical dependency. Each successful purslane integration proves that working with ecological processes produces better results than fighting them. The revolution happens not through policy changes or technological breakthroughs, but through millions of small decisions to value plants for their function, rather than their appearance or commercial status. This approach, you know, really challenges the dominant narrative that productive gardens require constant inputs, intensive management, and, well, a never-ending war against unwanted plants. Perslane actually demonstrates an alternative, where the garden provides its own solutions, where diversity strengthens rather than complicates production, and where honestly, careful observation reveals opportunities that conventional wisdom tends to overlook. The shift costs nothing at all, requires no special equipment, and over time delivers benefits that just keep compounding as soil health improves and natural systems start to establish a genuine balance. Subscribe to the Living Soil Lab for more insights into plants the agricultural establishment usually dismisses, but regenerative gardeners recognize as powerful allies. Please, share your experiences with Purslane and other dynamic accumulators in the comments. Go ahead and test these concepts in your own gardens and, if you can, document the results. The evidence honestly already exists in research literature and traditional farming practices worldwide. The missing piece, really, is widespread application by home gardeners who are willing to question old assumptions and experiment with approaches that prioritize soil biology over chemical inputs. The purslane revolution begins with a single decision, to stop pulling and start observing what this remarkable plant can offer when it's given the chance to perform its true ecological function.